Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Judith Hockey? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Judith Hockey was born on January 9, 1967, and lived in Ohio. When she was three years old, she was backed over by a car and severely injured, but eventually recovered. Her parents divorced and her mother remarried. Judith dropped out of school at the age of 17 and moved to Arizona to live with her father, but she wasn't there for long. She moved to Alaska with a boyfriend before moving back to Ohio. In 1991, Judith married a man named Scott, and they had a daughter together. The couple divorced after a few years. In 1998, Judith met a man named Robert Brenniger, who had a son named Corey from a prior relationship. The couple married and moved into a double-wide trailer on Kyle Street in Mark Center, Ohio. This is about 70 miles west of Toledo. Judith and Robert had a son together, and Judith adopted Corey. Robert was employed by a company called Steel Dynamics, where he worked at night. He would regularly go to sleep at about noon while wearing earplugs. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On November 3, 2003, 10-year-old Corey was greeted by his stepmother, Judith, when he was dropped off by the school bus after school. After this, Judith took the other two children to a relative as Corey stayed in the trailer with his father, Robert. His father was asleep at this time, as usual. Sometime around 4 p.m., Corey retrieved a 410 bore shotgun, walked into his father's bedroom, and shot his father in the head. After the shooting, Corey called 911 and requested help. He said, quote, I was giving him the gun. I didn't know it was loaded. Unquote. When the police arrived, they found that Robert had died from a single shotgun blast to the head. Corey said to one of the first responders, quote, It feels like my fault. Unquote. It's hard to imagine where that idea could have come from. Maybe it came from the shooting his father in the head with the shotgun part. A police officer spoke to Corey at the scene. Corey said that he had taken pamphlets on gun safety into the bedroom for his father to read. Corey was carrying the gun with his finger on the trigger and, quote, it shot, unquote. Yet another shooting tragedy caused by an eagerness to learn gun safety. When will the gun safety education fatalities stop? Investigators found Corey's story difficult to believe because he made it clear that his father was having a conversation with him immediately before the shooting. Robert had earplugs in his ears when he was killed and appeared to be in bed asleep. How was he having a conversation with Corey. Despite these inconsistencies, the shooting was ruled accidental. Corey was never charged with a crime, and the case was closed. Judith collected almost $500,000 in life insurance and moved away from Mark Center, Ohio. In October of 2010, she married a man named Gary Hawkey. It seemed like everyone had moved on with their lives. However, this was not the case. In March of 2012, Corey told one of his teachers that the shooting of his father was not accidental. Rather, he had been directed to kill his father by Judith Hawkey. Furthermore, he claimed that Judith had mistreated him for years. On March 23, the police spoke to Corey. Here's what he told them. Before the shooting, Judith told Corey that Robert had a brain tumor and was dying. Medical professionals couldn't do anything to help him. Robert wanted to be killed so the family would have some money. On the day of the shooting, Judith met Corey at the bus stop and told him that the shotgun was in the laundry room. She ordered him to shoot Robert that day. After Judith and her two children left, Corey went into the laundry room and retrieved the shotgun. He entered the bedroom where Robert was sleeping, positioned the shotgun a few inches away from Robert's head, and pulled the trigger. The gun did not discharge. However, Corey tried again and was successful. It sounds like after the gun didn't discharge, Corey simply cycled the action to chamber a shell. After killing his father, Corey dropped the weapon and called 911 as Judith had instructed him. 
Corey also told the police that Judith had mistreated him in a variety of ways. For example, she beat him on a daily basis, which left him covered in bruises, tried to kill him on multiple occasions, ordered him to climb up scaffolding so he would fall, and threw him into a pond when he was wearing a Halloween costume so he would drown. Furthermore, Corey said that Judith was attempting to kill her new husband, Gary Hawkey, by putting poison in his coffee. About a year later, in March of 2013, Judith Hawkey was arrested and charged with aggravated murder, insurance fraud, and four counts of endangering a child. Her trial started on October 28, 2013. On November 8, she was found guilty on all counts. The next month, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In 2016, Judith Hawkey won an appeal and her convictions were overturned. The court said that three of the witnesses who testified at her trial should not have because their testimony was hearsay. One witness was the teacher who Corey told about the alleged plot. The second witness was a physician, and the third witness was a mental health professional. The state's case heavily depended on these witnesses, and retrying Judith without them would have been risky. As it turns out, the state would never have to take the chance. Judith Hawkey agreed to an Alford plea. This is a type of guilty plea where the defendant maintains their innocence. However, they concede that the state could convict them based on the evidence. Judith was convicted of involuntary manslaughter and endangering a child. She received a 10-year sentence, but had already served five years. Her sentence expired in February of 2023. Therefore, I would presume that she was released from prison. Now moving to my analysis. Judith Hawkey maintains her innocence, and there are some people who believe her. They argue that the case against her was completely dependent on Corey. The state, of course, disagrees. They argue that Judith coerced Corey to shoot his father. This brings me to the question, was Judith Hawkey guilty of a charge like murder or manslaughter? Let's take a look at the evidence, both for and against the idea that she was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. On the day of the shooting, a neighbor saw Judith meet Corey at the bus stop. She put her arm around him in an affectionate manner, which was unusual for Judith. Some of the first responders at the scene of the shooting didn't think that Judith Hawkey was showing any sympathy to Corey. For example, she repeatedly told him to stop crying. The day after the shooting, Judith made her way to the payroll department of the company where Robert had worked. She completed the paperwork to collect his life insurance. She collected almost $500,000. Corey testified that Judith manipulated him into killing his father. As far as the claim that Judith had mistreated Corey, two of his teachers noticed that he had bruises. Moving to the exculpatory factors, several people indicated that they never saw Judith do anything harmful to Corey. They had no idea what Corey was talking about. At the time of the shooting, Corey never mentioned anything about intentionally killing his father or being mistreated by his stepmother. A police officer who interviewed Corey didn't see any indication that he was afraid of Judith or that she was acting inappropriately. All the investigators were satisfied that the shooting was accidental. Even if the shooting was not accidental, Corey could have acted alone. Judith did not have to be involved. Robert had obtained supplemental life insurance policies at work when he was hired in the year 2000. Judith was not part of that process. She did not arrange for him to have life insurance. The police had interacted with Corey in 2001 prior to the killing and did not see any indication that he was being physically mistreated. None of Corey's pediatric medical records supported his claims of mistreatment. There was an incident where Corey fell from scaffolding. He blamed his stepmother for this, but the evidence does not support this claim. Medical professionals who treated him did not detect bruises above and beyond what would be expected from the fall. According to Corey's narrative, he was being beaten daily at this point, therefore he should have been covered in bruises. Corey claimed that he had been removed from the hospital by Judith against medical advice. The medical records contradict this claim. Medical professionals said everything was normal and the family was supportive. Corey had several follow-up exams after the fall, but no bruises or other injuries were detected. 
Corey claimed that he was not given enough food by his stepmother, yet no medical reports noted any type of malnutrition. Corey offered a few different stories about what happened on the day of the shooting. For example, his fifth grade teacher said that Corey told her the shooting was caused by a dog knocking over a gun. A man who dated Judith on and off for three or four years said Corey told him the same thing. A man that Judith dated in 2008 said that Corey told him he tripped over the firearm and it accidentally discharged. Corey told a mental health clinician that he slept in the laundry room and did not have a bedroom until after Robert died. This is not true based on photographic evidence. Corey did appear to have a bedroom. Corey claimed that he was not permitted to sleep for extended periods of time, yet school records did not indicate any problems with Corey falling asleep in class. According to Corey, when he and Judith were alone in an ambulance together after the shooting, she coached him about what to say. In reality, they were never alone together in that ambulance. Corey claimed that he attempted to perform CPR on his father, but Corey had no blood on him. As far as the story about Robert having a brain tumor, Corey said that Judith told him this about a month before the shooting. Later, Corey admitted that it was only a couple of days before the shooting. Corey had accused Judith of trying to poison her husband, Gary Hawkey. A toxicology screen for Gary came back negative. Corey later admitted that he lied when he said that he saw Judith put something in Gary's coffee. One item of exculpatory evidence is based on the idea that Corey borrowed his narrative about being mistreated from a book. In 1995, a man who claimed he was mistreated when he was young published a book titled A Child Called It. The book became a bestseller. Several copies of this book were available in the library of the school that Corey attended, and the book was popular among the students. Furthermore, a witness testified that she had seen Corey with this book. There were stunning similarities between the stories in the book and Corey's narrative. Here are just a few examples. Both stories had the mistreatment starting at age four and increasing in severity. Both involved standing in the same place for long periods, being burned with a lighter, and being given food that siblings failed to consume, like only getting their leftovers. Both narratives involved being isolated from the family during meals, being accidentally stabbed, doing chores all day, eating scraps from a dog's bowl, being forced to take a cold bath, being hit with a broom, and being punished for doing well in school. In the book, the alleged victim was forced to jump off a boat. Corey had a story about jumping into a pond. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Judith Hawkey was guilty of murder or manslaughter? No, I do not believe she was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Without the testimony of Corey, convicting Judith would have been impossible. Corey does not appear to be a credible witness. I think what happened in this case is that Judith was an unlikable person. She was described as vulgar and unsophisticated. No one could understand why a 10-year-old would shoot his father. Therefore, when Corey changed his story, it made sense to people that Judith was behind the incident. They were willing to overlook the fact that Corey was caught in many lies. What actually happened in this case remains a mystery. Maybe Judith did tell Corey to pull the trigger. Maybe Corey wanted to kill Robert. Perhaps Corey was playing with the shotgun and did not intend to kill Robert. I think the most likely theory is that Judith directed Corey to kill Robert, but again, there's no way to prove that. Just like Judith found herself in trouble because she was unlikable, Corey found himself difficult to believe because of his deceptive behavior. Everybody in this case had a credibility problem. Now moving to my final thoughts. One of the most frightening aspects of this case is how a jury originally convicted Judith of murder based in no small part on the testimony of a mental health professional who was simply repeating what Corey had stated. This case illustrates how jury members can make irrational decisions and how they do not have enough skepticism about the testimony of mental health clinicians. It also shows that when a child perpetrates a killing, people are eager to believe that an adult must be responsible. Those are my thoughts in the case of Judith Hawkey. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. 
Thanks for watching.